Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Engineering Student Experience Podcast. I'm Paul Nissenson from the Mechanical Engineering Department at Cal Poly Pomona. Back in March of this year, which was only a couple months ago, but feels like an eternity, the coronavirus pandemic was just beginning, and universities across the world moved rapidly to online instruction. Most instructors were given just a few days to retool and rethink how they would continue teaching in an online environment. At the time my university moved to online instruction, I had a conversation with a couple engineering colleagues where we talked about what life was like for engineering instructors during this historic event. Those guests were Dr. Nolan Suchia, who's in my mechanical engineering department, and Dr. Jessica Perez, who's in the electromechanical engineering technology department. And you can hear that conversation back in episode 12. When that initial conversation was recorded, there was a lot of uncertainty about the infection rates and mortality rates, whether our healthcare system would be completely overwhelmed, and how instructors and students would adjust to online instruction, which was completely foreign to most instructors at that time. Over the next couple months, instructors made the necessary adjustments to finish out the spring term. It was a bizarre period of time where our normal modes of interacting with one another, you know, with our students, with our colleagues, with our own family members, with the general public, were completely upended. Unfortunately, at the time I'm recording this, it seems that the coronavirus pandemic is not going away anytime soon, and we will need to continue being cautious. Many universities are opting to have online classes for at least the summer term and probably the fall term as well. And after that, who knows what will happen with classes in 2021. Today's episode was recorded just after the spring term had finished, which was about two months after that initial conversation took place back in episode 12. Nolan, Jessica, and I discuss how we adjusted our teaching styles for an online environment and how Nolan and Jessica are balancing their parental obligations with their teaching obligations. We discuss the various changes in our students and ourselves and what our plans are for teaching in the summer and fall. For students out there listening, I hope this episode helps to humanize your instructors. We didn't ask to be in this situation either, and we're trying to make the best of it. Before we jump to the interview, I want to share a few housekeeping items. First, I want to mention that this episode was recorded back in mid to late May, several days before the protests related to the use of force by police have erupted across the U.S. and the world. So you'll understand why Nolan, Jessica, and I don't discuss the protests, even though they've dominated the news in recent weeks. The second item I want to mention is that in a previous episode, I said I was considering changing the theme music for this podcast to something a bit more somber to reflect the time that we're living in. 2020 seems to be a pretty bad year for most people, and that's not even halfway over yet. Well, I was unable to find a new theme song that I like, so for the time being, we'll be sticking with the current theme music. And I don't think changing the theme song would have improved anything this year anyways. The next item I want to mention is that since we had to record this episode online, the sound quality during the interview is less than ideal. There are some limitations with the recording software and hardware available to myself and the guests, and you know I'm learning to work within these limitations. But despite these limitations, I think the sound quality is good enough for the purpose of this podcast. The last thing I want to mention is, if you're enjoying this podcast, there are a few easy ways that you can support it. You can subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcast app, such as Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and many others. You can rate the podcast and leave comments on whatever app you use to listen to the podcast. And finally, You can help spread the word about the podcast by telling your friends, family, classmates, or whoever you think would benefit from this podcast. If you have any comments about this episode, feel free to email me at tesepodcast at gmail.com, and I'll place the email address in the show notes. I'll personally read each email and try my best to respond to them all. And now, I bring you our conversation. I hope you enjoy it. (laughs) 
So today I'm checking in with two of my favorite people in the world, a couple of my Cal Poly Pomona engineering colleagues, Nolan Suchia, Jessica Perez, both have been guests before on the podcast. And Nolan and Jessica, thanks for joining me for this post-semester wrap-up discussion. Of course. Thank you for having us again. Yeah, should be fun. So last time we talked was a little over two months ago, and a lot has changed since then. Um, at least in California, it looks like the pandemic wasn't as bad as the worst predictions, but we're all kind of on a, a quarantine type situation. So uh, how has your family life been during the last couple of months? Um, it's been fine. I mean, we're adjusting each day. My husband's still working, so he's out of the home. And then the kids and I are just kind of chilling. You know, they're teenagers. They do their thing. They ask for help if they need it. They have been very busy with school. Their school is keeping them in live classes. So they've not gotten an early break. And so, um, you know, we've been walking the dog every day. And my living room turns into a dance studio at 3 o'clock every day so that my daughter can dance. And, uh, you know, my son's working on his soccer skills in the backyard. So it's just, I mean, it's trying to be as normal as we can in our home. So have you, been, have you been able to balance your teaching obligations with your family obligations? That's to me the hardest part because I feel like there's never a stop to my day now because I work at home. And so like the computer's in the living room because that's the space that we have. And so, you know, I'll be working on something and like there's chaos going on behind me or if I get an email, it's just faster to answer it right away. But there's no... I get to work, I do my work, I kind of button up for the day and I go home. So for me, that's been a little bit frustrating and something I'm going to work on going forward is setting a better schedule for myself so that I'm not so, so that there's more definition to my day. How about you, Nolan? Yeah, sure. I can, <clears throat> I think uh, my experience is probably very different uh, from Jessica's. Well, they're similar in that uh, I'm home 100% of the time and my kids are home 100% of the time, and my wife is still at work. Uh, she's a nurse at, at Children's Hospital. Uh, the only difference is my kids are not independent. <laughs> my kids are four and almost two. So the four-year-old requires you know, 90% of my attention. The, the baby requires 100% of my attention. My job requires 100% of my attention. So generally speaking, I'm operating at nearly 300%. On a daily basis, the days, yeah, the days I've been living the same day for the past hundred days in a row. So, so I'm. I it think is legit it, Groundhog Day. Yeah, I was going to say Bill Murray in Groundhog Day. Uh, for some of our younger listeners, I, they may not get that reference, but that's okay. It's basically a movie where where Bill Murray lives the same day over and over and over. And so, it's a great movie. I'm there. Yeah, it's I'm great there. Movie. It's a great movie, yeah. Looking for creative outlets, you know, just anything to change up the day a little bit. I know it's a podcast, but uh, if there were video, you'll notice that I shaved my head just for the, just for the exhilaration. <laughs> that will be the uh, thumbnail image. Oh, great. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. By the way, I don't think it's a great look. I'm, I'm probably never going to do this again, but it gives you kind of a sense of where I'm at sort of mentally. So do you feel like the last like two and a half months, a lot of people are kind of feeling like this time, time is not experienced normally. Like either it's going really, really fast or really, really slow. Weekends are bleeding into weekdays and it's kind of disorienting to many people. Are you guys experiencing that? To some extent, I mean, but I still set my alarm every day. So if it doesn't go off, it's a weekend. So at least there's that. And, you know, my children are still in school. So that definitely is still keeping me on the regular and keep and teaching synchronously actually has helped with that too, because I know I have to be in class these days and these times. And so that's been good. It definitely, there's less division between like weekends and weekdays. And you know, that that's kind of what I was saying, like it all kinds of bleeds together, but I've been trying to set some schedule. Yeah. That's probably the key. I think uh, I, I have, mm -hmm. I have none right now and I don't set an alarm. My kids are my alarm. If they decide to sleep in, I get a little extra sleep. If they decide to wake up early, well, that's 
that's a wrap on the day from from the morning. Right. And then generally, you know, you know, on a, on a typical day, they're they're awake for twelve or thirteen hours, and during that time, there's just nothing else but parenting. Right. Yeah. So my 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 work, my day job, my day job starts at like ten p.m. every day. That's when I I'll get to sit down and muddle through emails or do grading or or whatever until basically I pass out. The time dilation thing is crazy because my friends without kids seem to feel that, I don't know, they're really bored. Right? They're running out of things to do, whereas I'm struggling to make it to the end of the day. So it's like kind of an opposite situation. Yeah, I don't know that I would say that I'm bored ever, uh, but... Well, yeah, you wouldn't be bored, I, I, I imagine. Yeah, with the teenagers and stuff, but yeah. I agree. Like, there's definitely... I have a friend who's been really strict on her quarantine and she has two two-year-old twin boys. Wow. Um, wow. I, I don't know how she's doing it. It's insane to me. Like The time dilation is funny. My, my wife sent, somebody sent me a meme. So there were 28 days in February and there were 150 days in March and April was a year and a half, I think is what it said, which, which feels about right. I remember the first couple days around the time that we were making that transition to, to online instruction, time slowed down. It felt, for me, it felt like every day was a week or two. And then since then, since I kind of got used to the rhythm after a couple of weeks, then it's kind of the opposite where yeah. I, I definitely lose track of the dates. Like if you told me it was, we're recording this on, see, I don't even know, is it May 20th? Or 22nd. See, I didn't even know. <laughs> recording on May 22nd. And if you would have told me it was May 12th, I would have believed you. I'll often, you know, I take, you know, my, I'm a parent, right? So my, my phone is filled with pictures of my kids. And uh, at the end of the day, once they, you know, asleep, I'll take a little bit of time to just scroll through and see what, you know, see what we did during the day. And I'll look at a picture from that morning and I can't remember like I cannot believe that that was that same morning. <laughs> you know, it felt like felt like days ago. Yeah, um, they also could be due to lack of sleep, maybe. Probably something, yeah. some combination of that and Groundhog Day effect. Yeah, yeah. So I fall into that camp of not having kids, and I'm finding that I'm getting bored. Yeah. Um, so I've decided to take up uh, hydroponics, and I'm inter entertaining my students with updates occasionally. Um, cool. Have you guys picked up any new hobbies? I cleaned the ha I cleaned the living room today. That's, <laughs> uh, that's amazing. Yeah. I walk the dog every day. That's a new hobby. I mean, my outings are usually like the grocery store, and uh, my daughter quilts, so we've been quilting a lot together. So it's pretty cool. That's about it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to when my kids kind of have their own hobbies where they can kind of spend some time in their own world, you know, mm -hmm. their own space. Mm -hmm. All my hobbies that I've had to sort of, I mean, I've had to modify everything. You know, I'm a biker, so I like to ride my bike. So lately I'll, you know, I dug out the trailer, um, put on the bike seat and we'll do like rides to the park where I'm just sort of trailing both kids behind. I've been to, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a former bike mechanic. So I know that uh, when the bike shops build their bikes, they throw out these huge cardboard boxes. And so recently I went and picked up a whole stack of cardboard boxes and we've been building a bunch of stuff. You know, we built like a slide in the house. We built a little go-kart out of an electric skateboard and a cardboard body. You got to build a fort, right? Oh, of course we built a fort. The fort turned into a restaurant. So they have their like kitchen stuff in the fort. Um, there's a little serving window. You know, so. Are you keeping people six feet apart? It's a drive-through. It's oh, yeah. yeah. There's there's pick no dine only. no dining options, right? Yeah, pickup only. It's, it's pickup only, right? <laughs> that was something new. We tie dyed a shirt. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So my you know my my stuff basically has to involve uh, the little the little kids too, which is is a challenge to be creative on a daily basis to come up with try and come up with new stuff for them so they don't they don't get too bored. Have you had a chance to see any friends or extended family? Or are you guys kind of hunkering down there, there are days when i that go by where i don't speak to another adult human we yeah we haven't we've been fully quarantined haven't visited um family or friends we'll do the occasional zoom chat uh, but that's about it i still see my mom and my brother they live uh 
around the corner. And so we've stayed um, with them. My mom cares for my grandma. So if we like, if they need anything, we go for them. So what's the biggest thing you guys miss about having to be restricted most of the time to your home? I miss a lot of things. I miss having the freedom to do what I like to choose what I want to do. And I, I'm kind of a homebody anyway. So I miss hanging out with like, and like having barbecues and stuff like that, but, or like being around our friends, but I'm kind of, I'm okay with being home. I think it's harder for me to watch my kids struggle with being home more than anything else. Like my daughter's really missing out on some stuff. And so for me, it's harder that she's struggling. I miss walking around aimlessly for no reason and just like browsing things. But Yeah, I, I used to think I was, I mean, I definitely am a homebody. I, I enjoy just hanging around at home, but I never thought that I would have a problem with being forced to stay at home the way I am now. I mean, some days, most days, we don't leave the property even. Um, at most, we'll venture out, go for a walk. Uh, we live by this network of trails, so we'll do a little bit of walking on the trails. But even then, we don't make it very far because, you know, little kids. So, yeah, yeah, I think there's this new sort of this article that came out about how it looks like a lot of Americans are planning road trips for the summer because they can't really do any major trips. So that would be nice. I would really enjoy doing that, but I still don't, I don't know if it's time yet. So, Yeah. I think for me, it's that not necessarily that I have to be at home, but it's, as Jessica mentioned, it's losing that ability to choose. And I mean, I would love to have the option of going to San Diego this weekend, but no, you know, that's not going to happen. <laughs> Just got to kind of stay at home, maybe go to the supermarket yeah. as adventurous as I'm going to be. Right. You only want what you can't have. Now that you can't, now you really want to. How have your colleagues been adapting to the past couple months? And how have you guys been adapting to things like online department meetings? Um, I would say for me, like, I think this first go at it was just hold on for dear life. And so I don't think there was a lot of development done and everyone was kind of sharing strategies. But I think now that we know in the fall, we're going to be um, virtual again or remote or whatever we're going to call it. Um, you know, I've been doing a lot of work trying to make myself a better online instructor already. And so I think, I hope that that's what's going to be happening over the summer is that people are really working on becoming better online professionals over the summer. That seems to mirror what we have been doing in Emmy. Gen- generally, the department meetings are open discussion, but they always kind of eventually we hone in on some very specific nuance of online teaching and it just becomes a discussion on how different faculty are handling that particular scenario. But yeah, I think Jessica's right. As, as we move into fall, people sort of find their rhythm in online teaching and then hopefully from here, it's sort of an, an iteration to try and improve upon this, this first go at it that we had over the spring. I've already found like four or five different things that I'm going to try in the fall um, and like really be more mindful about my instruction and reworking my tests again. Like I thought I had a good go at it in the spring, but I have more ideas for the fall. And so really trying to roll out those type of ideas and being more purposeful in what I'm doing. And it can get very little kid video very fast online if you're not real careful about it. And so, but it can also be really lonely too. You know, you're in this screen of all black because no one turns on their camera, which that's fine. I get it. But you know, it's just hard. Yeah. So that's something that I think everyone's been encountering, which is the uh, either students don't have a webcam or they don't want to turn it on. And I don't feel right asking them to do so. There could be a lot of reasons why they don't have it on. And I don't want to pry into their lives. So Nolan, I, I would assume that you also encountered that. Yeah, definitely. It's a, it was really an adjustment to try and maintain your same level of like energy that you would have in the classroom uh, while sitting in a you know four foot corner of your bedroom at home, right, staring at the computer screen. So I definitely got more comfortable with it by the end of the semester. One of the things that I did was during the sort of live discussion sections. At first, I was kind of hesitant to ask questions as I normally would and sort of poll the class in real time. 
you know, sort of like, what do you think about that type of question? Just because I was afraid of the awkward silence that would, you know, in, inev inevitably follow. But by the end, I, I kind of used that as a tool. You know, I'd pose a question and I would just sit there and wait and sort of let the, let the silence kind of drive the conversation because eventually some students will recognize that you actually want an answer and you want some engagement and they'll, they'll start to participate. Um, and by the end, you know, several, more than a handful of students were regularly joining in. And I think that momentum encouraged other students who normally wouldn't talk in this online format to start engaging as well. So did you find that, that students were more willing to use the chat window or were they more willing to ask, uh, actually ask it out loud? Yeah, yeah, that's a good, almost a whole nother topic there. The chat window is definitely always kind of going. There's always like a feed in the chat window. So um, part of, I think, what I learned about uh, trying to teach effectively in that setting is to sort of keep tabs on both, right? sort of keep your train of thought going while also monitoring the chat window and, and answering those questions in real time as well. But yeah, students have definitely been more active in the chat window because there's less of a, I don't know, psychological effect. They just type it out and it's there. Whereas speaking out loud or even audio, let alone video, is I think more intimidating for the students. Yeah, it's a, it's a skill though to try to focus on what you're saying and maybe you have distractions at home, right? So you have to you're paying attention to that too. And then there's the chat window that sometimes comes up or, or lights up. And then sometimes if you miss that, then you miss the question. And it's a, definitely a brand new skill that we're all learning. I assign someone like during my classes, I'm like, okay, who's monitoring the chat for questions? So you got to stop me. I had one student that was always like, I'll monitor the chat if there's a question. Other than that, it was their way to communicate with each other while I was communicating. So I didn't have the chat window open, obviously would pop up if there was something in the chat. But I told them, I'm like, this is how we're going to run because I cannot focus on both at the same time. So if there's a question in the chat that I need to answer, you're in charge, you can monitor it. And then they would just use it to communicate with each other, which was really helpful because then, you know, if you're recording the session, you can see what was going on in the chat and you can kind of then go back and say, okay, I need to readdress whatever, or, oh, they answered each other's questions. It's fine. Um, I don't really need to go back and revisit that topic. So Nolan mentioned that a couple of ways that he's changed over the last couple of months. So he's more willing to ask questions, trying to keep better tabs on the chat window. Are there other ways that you both have changed over the last two months that hopefully would make you a more effective online instructor? I'm bigger on the prep than I was. Even I'm a big prepper but now it's like next level for preparation for our class. So um, I've always been a big, I'm going to be prepared. And these are the things I'm hoping, like these are my objectives for this day. And this is what I want to get out of the day. But now it's at like next level. So like, this is the way, because I can't see everyone's face to interact with them. So I don't know if they're not getting it. Like I was just reading some things about, you can do polls in Zoom. So I'm going to add polls into my Zooms next semester where like, I'm going to do immediate checking for understanding throughout. And, you know, I didn't have to build that if it was just for a temporary thing, but now it's a semester. So I'm going to have to do that kind of stuff. And then, you know, just looking at like being purposeful with uh, assignments I'm asking them to complete. Usually I give them like longer time to complete it and it's a longer assignment, but I've broke that to smaller. I've been giving better feedback on it. And I think that that has definitely made me a better instructor and understand where students are, even if I can't see them. Like I can tell, oh, I need to go back for like this group of students, they're really struggling on whatever it is. And so I can readdress that in the next session. Yeah, I think those are all valid things to do. One of the things that stands out from my experience is uh, sort of the horizon length of how far you need to sort of prepare the students for you know, the coming week if that makes any sense. Whereas before I would have a very organized syllabus. And by the way, I'll have to, you know, I think a lot of going into fall is going to have a, a much more detailed syllabus so that each day almost they know what is expected of them and what's due and what's assigned. But one of the, one of the uh, comments that I received was on Blackboard, I shelled out, I did it week by week. So in Blackboard, I would post up the entire week's worth of activities, what's going to be you know, what lectures you're supposed to watch, what assignments you're supposed to do, what's due when. 
and students wanted more than that. Like they, you know, it, you know, by Wednesday, they wanted to see what was going to happen during the next week. I guess what I'm trying to say is that you just have to prepare a, a longer stretch of time so that students can see further into, into the next week. Just and mark so everything they, tentative because it will 100% change. Yeah, right. And that's, that's the tough part too. You could spend all this time planning exactly what's supposed to happen and then one, one little hiccup if you need to spend an additional half an hour on one thing, then that sort of pushes everything downstream. But yeah, the, the preparation and sort of, I, I guess, I, you know, I mentioned this last time, the transparency and the communication is just going to be key going forward because the students can't access you as easily anymore. They can't just drop into your office and ask you a question. So the more clear and transparent your course is, I think the better it is for everybody. That's what I've learned from my own children. Like my son, he's, you know, he's like, some of my teachers aren't very good at directions. And now that's compounded because they're trying to write it out. And the way they write it doesn't necessarily make sense to me. And I know when I was that I struggle with direction. So I'm really trying to be really mindful about how I give instructions for things. And that's for me a new challenge to give really detailed instructions. Like Nolan's saying, you can't just like, someone can't ask a clear, they can ask a clarifying question if they're there, but you know, then that bleeds into that. I don't have a flow to my day because I'm ask, answering questions for every, like if I'm not good on my directions, then my day is gonna get very long, very quick. Where do you guys usually teach? What room do you usually teach in? Uh, well, you can't, I suppose you can't see it now, but this is just the southward facing corner of my bedroom. Uh, there's a little desk here that I set up and I've got my tablet and headphones and computer and books all stacked up here. And this is where everything happens. This is just it. If I'm doing a class or if I've got a section going, by the way, those can only happen on days when you know my wife is at home. The live sessions, those can only happen on those days when she's at home for the kids, I close the door, try and ask the kids to <laughs> go play or, or stay out of the room, which doesn't always happen. So, yeah, but this is my office at home. I'm in the living room. I think I'm going to move my desk to the other side of the living room. Right now I'm on a card table with two TV trays because <laughs> I'm high class. So I'm on a card table that I borrowed from my mom with two TV trays. I've got books and papers and markers and everything stacked all over and I leave the sliding glass door that's next to me unlocked so I can open it and close it 500,000 times for the dog every day and she I think partially moving to the other side of the off to the living room because then I won't be right by the door so the dog won't see me so she won't be in and out as much hopefully I don't know it's I'm teaching summer so I have a couple I have you know four days to figure it out and uh it'll be it's fine, but I'm staying in the living room. Yeah, I took over my dining room table for two months. Just crap spread out all over homeworks and books and teaching related materials. And I finally just today just cleaned it up. <laughs> so my wife's very happy. Uh, like a week ago, I took all the but because I'm not teaching the same class in the summer that I taught in the spring. So I took my spring books and I put them in a box on the floor and I put my summer books out so that I can just have one set of books at the same time. And then in the fall, I'll have a whole new set of books. And during this semester, one thing that I always kept hearing from faculty at our institution and elsewhere was the uh, issue of trying to maintain academic integrity. So trying to make sure students don't cheat. Do you think that in your classes, there was a significant amount of cheating? Um, and how did you address that? And how did you conduct your final exam since you had to do it online? The issue of exams is definitely the elephant in the room. As far as I know, there's not a perfect solution. There's, there's only there's only mitigation. You could, you could make it more challenging for students to cheat. And I guess the goal ultimately would be to make it so challenging that it's just not worth their time. You know, they would rather make, make it so that they would rather just take the test than spend the, the time and effort required to figure out a way to, to cheat, uh, which sounds grim. Uh, but unfortunately, I think that's just the reality of it. Um, so I have done a number of things to try and mitigate it. A, a lot of faculty, it, it seems like there's one solution that is is a decent 
option, but that requires more work. So, so faculty seem to be turned off from that. And that's ultimately just writing a brand new test from scratch. Uh, I think that's one way to actually make it more challenging. There's, there's no solutions available. There's no book or solution manual that they, students can check um, if it's your own exam. Um, now, of course, that doesn't stop the issue of the students are just texting each other or FaceTiming, FaceTiming each other during the exam. There's, there's almost nothing you can do about that. But I, I think my solution so far has been to write exams from scratch. Um, and, and just, it's not a negative thing, but I, I've written more challenging tests. Uh, basically, I, I don't expect most students to finish the tests that I write. I'd rather look at their process and, and see how they were thinking, even if nobody finishes. That way you don't end up with, you know, 15 of the exact same response because one student figured it out and sent it out to the rest of the class. I don't know, that's, that's how I've been handling it. I haven't noticed, you know, my averages on the test haven't really changed much. I have the students handwrite an, act, you know, an integrity statement and sign it with the date at the top of every page of their exam as another little way to try and offset any, you know, cheating, maybe tap into their moral, <laughs> their moral side a little bit. But yeah, it's definitely still a problem. I, I don't know if, uh, Jessica, if you have any solutions or, or, or maybe you could talk about the things that you've done. I agree with Nolan. I mean, obviously writing a test from scratch is the first key because if you write a problem that's used somewhere else, they will find it. They will hunt it for, they'll spend more time trying to find it than it, anything else. So writing a test from scratch obviously helps. I've definitely changed the way I'm asking questions. So instead of just saying, you know, find the tension in this trust member, they have to go back and explain to me uh, why, their pro why they made the choices they made, how they worked the problem you know, using the conceptual understanding they've developed. I told them, I don't care about your answer as much as I care about your process and writing out every step and telling me what you did. But you know, that's the real world. I wanted, I was, I had to search really hard about why am I assessing students? Like I want them to know, but they need to know for themselves, which obviously, but in the real world, they're going to look. And so I really shifted the way I am asked questions. I don't, they have a timed part of it, but most of it's untimed and it's extensive and it's things that I wouldn't have been able to ask if it was a times test. So they're much more long problems, um, many more long problems. And, you know, I was able to give a cumulative exam at the end of the semester, whereas I would have had to pick and choose if it was in a traditional time setting. I mean, we had a question from almost every week, it feels like. So was that a bear for me to grade? Absolutely. But I also, you know, had them turn it in one page at a time so that they were able to work the test however they wanted. Um, I think it really worked in that respect that building in the flexibility for them. And, you know, if you're not understanding something, now is the time to learn it at least. So my grades aren't much higher than they ever were. They're a little bit higher. But, you know, you're making the best out of a bad situation. I'm definitely changing the way I'm testing in the fall again. I think I'm going to shift to more error analysis so that students have to explain, find the error and explain why it's wrong and then find the correct solution. So that would be um, a totally different way to test students. That is, that's news to me that, that you don't have timed exams. I guess first is what, what was your motivation for not doing a timed test? Does it have to do with the, the flexibility for students? that kind of thing? Um, that's part of it. Um, but also, you know, really thinking about if I'm trying to develop conceptual understanding, then that doesn't need to be time. And so shifting the way I was asking questions and being able to ask more in-depth questions, I thought was more important than giving it a time limit. It's a decision I kind of had thought. We had a long discussion about it in our department meeting, and most of my department is still doing time to test. Um, and still doing traditional testing. And, you know, one of the, my fellow instructors asked, you know, like, well, what's the purpose? And so he started giving more project-directed um, assessment, which that's great if you teach a 400-level class, but I teach a very entry, like this class, especially that I, in particular, is like the gatekeeper class, it's static. So how am I gonna, you can't ask a lot of like, pro, I can't have to do a project in statics necessarily 
no one has a truss in their backyard that they can go stand on and you know do that kind of stuff. So really understanding why things work the way they do. And so I thought, man, I don't need to give it a time. Interesting. Yeah, it never even occurred to me to do it that way. But I suppose you have the flexibility to do that now. Uh, the, the second thing is actually not a, it's more of a comment than a question. It sounds like a lot of what you're doing is you're getting away from the single numerical answer type of question and moving more towards a explain the process. Integrate, and, yes. Right. Demonstrate your knowledge of the concept, which is, I think, uh, a key also is, is like, if it's a numerical answer, that's easy for students to right. copy. And it kind of falls into that category of make it more, just make it a bigger hurdle for them to cheat, right? If they have to explain a whole process as right. the answer rather than just write down the number, then that should help. They'll, they'll go through, let's say if I'm using a question that is easy enough to find something similar, they'll go through and copy down that process, but they still have to then explain what's going on in each step. And so the solution manual tells you step by step what happens. I always know. One of my students told me, oh, yeah, Chegg is the third member of our study group. And so I know that that's available for students. So sometimes when I'm like, okay, Chegg is going to do it this way when you look, but that's not the way I'm instructing you. So I don't care which way you use. I'm going to show you both ways so that if you're using Chegg, you understand. But I think this way is easier and it's more flexible, but do whatever you want. So um, like one example I was thinking because, you know, you do a beam with, you know, two supports or whatever and a bunch of um, loads on it. I thought one way, I, like, for example, if I'm giving, so I give the reactions, but, you know, find two different loads at two different locations that would make this a true statement. Well, that's asking the same question. It's totally flipping it backwards and you still have to go through the process and understand as opposed to just finding the reactions of the supports. Yeah, I think all that makes a lot of sense. I think it's probably where all of this is heading. And I think that's a better exam question, to be honest. Like, I can, you know, take a moment, sum X and Y, that's pretty fast. But if I have to give you multiple different things that would make this beam in equilibrium, that's a lot harder question. Sure. The only negative part is that it's more work for you. It's forever for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not more work. It is forever. <laughs> right. Right. So there's that balance that we have to strike, I think. Which is why my days all bleed into each other. That's all right. Though. My first thought was that must be a nightmare to grade. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah, no, I've heard lots of ideas from, from various faculty, like, you know, maybe they make many versions of the same test. Maybe they make a pool of questions and have it run through their learning management system, which for us would be Blackboard. I've heard a lot of students who reported that the instructor will offer a test that'll have, you know, m many questions and they don't allow students to go back. Like they, they don't allow backtracking. So once you give an answer for problem number seven, you're on to problem number eight and you can't go back to one through seven. And I know a lot of students, they don't like that because normally when you take a test, you have the freedom to think about the first couple of questions and you could skip them over and let whatever's going on in the subconscious do its work and something might magically pop uh, into your head at a later time. So I could imagine if I was taking a test like that, it would be um, a bit frustrating. It's balanced. And that's kind of part of the reason I went away from the, they do have a short time to multiple choice part of their, like their final was a short time to multiple choice part. And then this hideous free response. But you know, if you have your clock is ticking and you have, you know, 20, 30 minutes through this timed portion and you're stuck on number one and you know you can't go back to it, that's a horrible testing environment. And so I just, I had to go away from it. I have a lot of students that, that just would be bad for them. I know it would be bad for my own children. So when, when I teach face-to-face -face classes, I always tell my students, hey, if you don't get a question, just move on to the next one, yep. you know, d answer what you can. And not allowing backtracking can make it very difficult for um, it, students. It's an excellent way to make sure they're not cheating, granted, but there's a lot going on for students. And so me stressing them out to where they're not getting past the first multiple choice question is, that's unconscionable. So do you think that student learning has been significantly negatively impacted this 
semester? Do you think that, for example, if students were taking a statics class, let's say, and the next semester they're going to take a materials class, which uses a lot of concepts from statics, do you think those students are going to be at a significant you know, disadvantage in the next semester? Well, I teach statics, and they're all going to be in my dynamics class next semester. Um, so I'll let you know. But um, I really think that that depends on the student. And we were fortunate in that we set a we started in the classroom, and so students were able to get to know each other. And there's times where I would come into the Zoom meeting, and I have them able to join before me, and they're all there talking about whatever they needed to talk about for the class. And so I think that was really good. I'm hoping that that continues to grow next semester when I have the same um, group of students. I think it depends. I, it depends on the instructor. It depends. I think that you can't discount what they've done. I think that most of them still learned. I think it's going to be a different type of learning. But I don't think that saying that, oh, it was online for two or three months or whatever it was means that you didn't learn anything. My son is at home learning, and he's learning a bunch. He's not doing it in the exact same way. He's doing a lot more independent research to figure out things. You know, he asked me, he's reading a book in his English class. And he's like, have you read this book? And I said, no. He's like, well, okay. That means there's going to be a lot more extra reading for me because if he doesn't understand something from the book, he can't ask me. I don't know. I haven't read that book. And so he has to do a lot of outside research if there's something that he doesn't understand. So he might understand it like entirely differently. He has his own perspective on the learning for sure. I think, uh, Jessica, you said a lot of it depends on the student, which I totally agree with, but I also think an equal amount depends on the faculty. For sure. Um, yeah, what I, what I found is you can put, towards the end of the semester, I've, I've discovered that you could put in a lot of time to your online class, or you could put in almost no time and still have a viable you know, class, so to speak, um, if you're just posting recorded lectures or PowerPoints and saying, here, you read this, you watch this, you figure it out, then, you know, you, you lose that element of the actual teaching, right? You're saying, if you're instructing students to watch a video, to me, that's not teaching, right? That's right. sort of delivering the content, but the teaching portion, in my opinion, comes from the, the back and forth, you know, the, the, the conversation and the discussion that you have with the students, which is, Oh, you know, I'll say, I said it once, I'll keep saying it, but that's, that's the part that I miss the most about all of this is that you go to lecture, you know, le lecture is partially for delivering content, but it's also there to engage your students, make them appreciate the, the bigger picture behind all this material, why are they learning it, and to get them motivated. And so that's the part that's missing. I, I won't say it's missing from the online or the virtual teaching environment, but you have to work harder to get it. For um, sure. I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so what I, you know, what I've done at, at, at this point is I've recorded the lectures and, you know, students will have to watch the lecture and then attend a live component, which serves as that sort of back and forth discussion. And I think hopefully, you know, the, the, the thing that makes me believe that that was valuable to the students is having that, that sort of live section is that it was optional. And yeah. yet, most students were still showing up every every session. So it seems like they got something out of being there, reviewing the, the the material in a way that's less linear. You know, not just watching a movie from start to finish, but you know, identifying a sticky point and sort of diving into that element. That was a benefit, I think, from doing those live sessions. And to be honest, those are the those are the components that took the most time. You know, just being there in a live setting, recording it posting it up to YouTube, making those videos available to the students, that actually took a lot of time. But I think that's one of the ways that I tried to preserve as much of the live teaching uh, environment as, as, as possible. So I, I wouldn't say that the online learning experience has to be negative, which is sort of the, mm -hmm. the basis of your question, Paul. I think it just, it takes more work to get there. Yeah, so is that been, you think, the most negative aspect about this whole experience? I mean, as it relates to school, uh, has been just missing the interaction with the students? Because I know for me, that's definitely the case. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't know how much, it, I think it'd be hard for students to quantify how much of a negative that is, but there's something in, you know, intangible about it, something that 
you can't exactly put your finger on, but you need to be in that classroom setting in order to get the most out of it, I think. Yeah. Or it could also be just a couple thoughts. Uh, for some students, I know that they have maybe a chaotic home environment. Uh, and so having a place where they can just focus on doing schoolwork um, is incredibly valuable. And I know a lot of students, like they, they, they kind of treat it like a job. You know, th- while I'm at school, I'm going to be doing schoolwork. And now they're something that they've kind of been trained to do their whole life, which is go to school, try to pay attention. This is where you're going to do your, your school related work. That's been completely stripped from them. And they're now having to figure out how to learn in this online environment. I'm having to learn how to teach in this online environment. It's very odd (laughs) for all of us. Yeah. I mean, I have a lot of students that now um, their primary worker for their entire family are the only ones working. And so they've had to flip their um, schedule around. I have students that are at school for a reason because that's the only place like you're mentioning that they can work. Their home is very full. And so one student was telling me in particular, I don't know if I mentioned it last time that she sleeps all day when everyone's up and does she's flipped her days and her nights entirely because that's the only time her house is functional for her as a student. And she just recently grad, she just graduated. So it was really important. I mean, that's the final push. And so she would um, just flipped her days and her nights entirely and was up all night doing work, schoolwork. And then during the day would sleep while her family was all awake. So although you'd think it would bring her closer to her family because they're together all the time, I think it pushed them farther away. Um, at least temporarily, because she didn't see them at all. Whereas if she was at school, she would have gone to school, come home, spent the evenings with the family as much as she could. Now she's not spending, she wasn't spending as much time with them at all. And it's pretty, I mean, I've had a lot of students, like they're the only ones working in their family. So they, you know, they had to make things do. It's been a definitely adjustment for students. Yeah. One thing that I've done to kind of Going back to what we were talking about earlier about not having that interaction with students, one thing that I started doing was creating GroupMe chat rooms with the, the GroupMe app. And so, um, you know, students can kind of ask questions at any time that they want. I turned off my notification settings so I can check it when I want. So I'm not getting pinged at 2 a.m. with some random question about the course. But I feel that students were fairly engaged in that chat room. They allowed it allowed them to kind of talk amongst themselves. And, you know, some students might not feel comfortable asking questions in class or coming to my virtual office hours, but they might feel comfortable, you know, essentially texting me. And I think too, I mean, our office, my office at least is kind of like on the main floor of the building, right by the bathroom. So it would always be the, Hey, what's up as they walk by. And then it was this you know, it was a trickle in and all of a sudden you look up and it's like a phone booth from the 1980s. Every It's so full. Everyone's trying to like that interaction. I think that students are missing a lot, just being with each other and being able to have that common space to talk about things that they've been thinking about at school and things that are frustrating with them at school because they don't have that at home. I have had a lot of students reach out and like, Hey, um, I'm going to start a zoom call and there's going to be six or seven of us on it. Come and be on the zoom with us. And so, you know, just kind of silly. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, I was on a zoom with two students um, who are roommates. So it's very convenient. And my daughter was in the back doing something for dance and they're like, Oh my God, what is she doing? And she was doing like this crazy backbend thing. And so then she's like, look, it's really easy. And she's trying to teach the two of them how to do a backbend. And then (laughs) One of them is trying it and he can't like get his back to bend. He just kind of flops backwards like a plank. And so there's been some moments like that that have been really fun. And I think it's really important for students to have that still. So again, going back to this, my day bleeds in like there's no start and stop. If a student's going to reach out and say, hey, would you join us for this? I'm going to automatically say yes. So do you feel like there's been any positive aspects of being quarantined at home? My dog's never looked better. She's going to be so thin when all this is over. (laughs) But I think it's good. I mean, I'm not driving my children three different places at two different times. And I'm forcing myself to have time to prepare things. Um, I wrote a chapter, uh, you know, that 
it that in that case has been really good. I feel very fortunate that we still have jobs and that you know I've been able to the politics have of the data even the politics of the day to day I don't have to worry about them because I'm at home. So if I don't want to hear it, then I just don't listen. And like you know, so and so did this to a department meeting and this and that. I don't care. <laughs> that off. I don't. It's been very interesting. And for any students listening out there, she's referring to the politics of being a faculty member. There's yeah, a, not other politics. Yeah, yeah. Politics there's a being a faculty member and like all of the the stuff that you don't know about that we don't tell you about. Although you can probably see it on all of our faces when it's going badly, <laughs> and we just tell you it's stuff at home. There's That's a surprising, yeah. There's a surprising large amount of politics that goes on behind the scenes. Unfortunately, sometimes, yeah. Yeah. I, I think Jessica, you're super positive, which is refreshing. You've seen some type of positive from all this quarantining business. It and, sucks. Um, Don't get me wrong. I hate it. <laughs> um, and there's days that are horrible. Like a couple of days ago, I don't even know what happened. I was just like, oh my gosh, this is the worst. And like, I don't know. One of my kids said something that totally wasn't meant to upset me. And I was like in the front yard and my husband got home. He's like, what's wrong? I'm like, this is the only quiet place in the house. <laughs> it's the front yard. I'm sitting on the, on the front porch, like crying. And uh, I'm like the dog and the cat, the cat bit me on the side of the head a couple of days ago. I'm oh, like, going to open the door. I'm going to let the cat out. That's it. The cat is done. <laughs> and yeah. so, I mean, if you let it, you go crazy. And I really it, feel the, the responsibility to be positive for students. Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, it's, it's, it's really tough. You know, I'm not, I don't want to claim that I'm in an, in any special situation. There are a lot of people out there with kids who have to work mm -hmm. and, and juggle little kids at the same time. But, and, and I don't want this to turn into a therapy session either. <laughs> so I'm going to keep my response brief. Uh, let's remember that I Debbie downed it last time. So <laughs> no, it's just, I, you know, it's tough to find a moment when you've got kids two kids that are four and, and one, essentially. Uh, I, I wouldn't be able to go out to the front porch for a moment for myself, you know? Mm -hmm. When things are getting crazy, it just, there's uh, there's not really an escape for those 12 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And so your day has to be fit around that enormous chunk of the of your waking life. And And the second part of the second layer to it is that, well, then the dad guilt starts to set in, right? Because I've got all this great time with the kids, they're super happy. They're having a good time. And most of it, you know, a lot of it is fun. It's, it's, a, it's a fun day if, if you just can get in the zone um, and just sort of be in the moment with your kids. But it's, it's a challenge to do that each day when that's your entire day, every day, and, and there's no real break on the horizon. So yeah. I, I will do my best to try and adopt a more yeah. positive attitude like you, Jessica. Well, I mean, we had like an Easter egg hunt in the front yard because – we couldn't do anything else. And so I, my husband and I went out and hid eggs in the front yard, the plastic ones, right? And he told the kids, there's a magic egg out there that has the chuck in it for, I don't even remember what he told him. And I was just like, oh my God, are you kidding me? And so the kids are trying to find this stupid egg. It has a check on it that says, psych, just kidding. And <laughs> I mean, they're teenagers, so it's okay. But <laughs> I mean, at some point in time, we're like, all right, whatever. This is the way it is right now. I'm just going to figure it out. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. It, was, it was fun to watch them try to be little again. I mean, they're 14 and 16 almost. And, but to watch them out there with their little baskets for an Easter egg hunt was hilarious. <laughs> well, that's funny because I'm in the opposite boat. We wanted to have one for our kids because they didn't get to have that this year. But we didn't have the plastic eggs. And it was, everything was close, so we couldn't get it. So it was like a, you know, like a emotional breakdown moment. We can't give this to our kids kind of deal. My daughter which is, is yeah. have a promotion from eighth grade next week or the week after. And it, there's days where it gets really ugly. And, you know, we spent the hour before this, you know, I was trying to get her to remember things because she's been with the same, same group of 20 students since she was five. So they've been together nine years in one oh. classroom. And so oh, wow. those kids know each other. And so just trying to be appreciative of what we're getting. That's a, where a lot of my drama comes right now is from the little ones. 
well, Paul, for somebody who, without kids, what are, what are the benefits that you've seen, or the positive sides? Less wear and tear on my car. <laughs> That's true. You drive far. Just 25 miles each way, but I get to sleep a little more. But uh, n- normally, you know, this time of year, immediately after grading, I'd plan some sort of vacation to go on, even if it's just for a weekend and yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think for me, the biggest positive is not necessarily in myself, but looking like taking a step back and looking at higher education in general. I might have mentioned this on another podcast, but this is the single largest faculty development event ever, like probably by like an order of magnitude. Um, I can't even think of another time where it comes close to people learning all different types of software, people who would never consider doing anything online are now experimenting in that space. And they may decide they hate it. They don't want to go back to it, but there will be a certain percentage of people who's like, I can take bits and pieces and hopefully in the long run, become better faculty, uh, better instructors, more effective. I knew people who didn't even know how to use our learning management system and who are teaching right now. So, I mean, that's, you're right. It's a huge leap. For a lot of people. So so while there's going to be a lot of pain for students now, I can easily imagine that in five years from now, long after this has passed and when faculty have more time to continue experimenting with these different technologies, the experience for students could be dramatically better. And I think too, um, instruction will be more purposeful. Like you don't have to cover every single solitary little thing or you're doing things that are more meaningful as opposed to just kind of popping through your syllabus. I'm just very eager to see what things will be like in about five years. There's that positive ment- mental attitude again. I got to really, <laughs> I got to really jump on that, that bandwagon. <laughs> it takes a long time. Don't worry. It was, this you caught me on a good day. Grades are done. So summer courses are going to be online everywhere. And I think most universities are going to be offering courses online in the fall at least. It looks like Cal Poly Pomona probably will. They haven't officially announced it yet, but it looks like it. So now that you have some time to actually plan your entire course, what kind of changes are you going to make to the course um, and how it's structured and how you're going to assess your students? I'm teaching a summer class, and I taught the class once before a couple of years ago. And so from that, I'm drastically changing. I have more group problem solving built in. So I'm going to use breakout rooms a lot during the session and force students to, you know, talk to each other and figure things out. Um, Much more open-ended problems in the fall. Like I was saying, I'm going to change how I'm instruct, how I'm um, assessing for certain, but just being more purposeful in what I choose to instruct and just kind of being, you know, I don't have to work 50 examples. I can work one really good one and take time to answer questions and really talk about the nuance of a problem, Um, especially because I'm not good at directions. So if I'm really purposeful on how I instruct, I think it'll help my students understand content better. So do less, do it at a deeper level, really do a think aloud, because that's kind of what I feel like anyways, because everyone turns their camera off, right? So I'm just talking to darkness anyway, so I might as well just talk to darkness and like think about, okay, so I was thinking about doing this problem this way, but I notice these things and being very purposeful in my think aloud, because that's, I feel like I'm talking to myself anyway, so it'll be fine. Yeah, I'm also teaching summer. I, I think by the end of the spring semester, I, I kind of got into a rhythm, if you can call it that, and had some sense of what a successful online class should look like. Um, Not that I was entirely doing it, but I kind of had an idea. And so I don't have any um, specific changes that I'm going to make going into summer, but my mentality is going to be totally different. Um, It's going to go from, basically the difference is going into summer, my mentality will not be panic anymore. It'll sort of be cautious optimism. I've got all these tools. I've learned a lot of lessons over the past couple of months. Now let's use that to sort of try and put together a, a coherent summer course. Um, so I, I'm a, a bit com- a bit more confident going into summer, much more so than I, I'm imagining everyone else was at the start of the quarantine. Um, so I think maybe in some indirect ways, the, the course will turn out better than this semester. Yeah, that's something I'm not even 
going to think about right now. I'm not teaching summer. I'm going to give myself a week or two to just kind of relax a bit. And then I got to start thinking about these things as well. But I guess for both of you, you don't have time to really relax. You're going to be teaching. I thought about the one thing that I'm going to need to really work on is how do you build that community in a class? Like it's been, it was easier when we started face-to-face and then went to an online format or virtual format, but how do you start it virtually? So that's kind of, I know the students that I have this summer all know each other. It's a technical elective class. So everyone knows each other. So that should be pretty easy, but I'm thinking in the fall for that one statics class, especially and my first year experience class, my freshman, um, you know, I'm teaching a lab for freshmen in the fall. This is their first lab experience in college. It'll be online. And so how do you build lab skills and a sense of community and understand the field of engineering remotely? So that's definitely in the back of my head. Like, how am I going to build in lab experiments that are authentic for students, but far away? So I got one last question for you both. Based on your experience so far and kind of thinking ahead about what fall is going to be like as you teach your courses online, probably, how do you think this entire experience of, you know, going through the pandemic, teaching online, how do you think it's going to change how you interact with your students once all of this passes and we are once again teaching in the classroom? I always tell my students it's, I feel it's really important to always be myself because if I learn to be who I am in a, like, you know, it's hard for students to find belonging sometimes. So if I'm always just me, then it's fine. And so I'm really forthright with what I think, how I feel about things. And I think that I'll even be more so that way when we're back face to face and encouraging students to speak what they feel. And to so I understand how they're thinking too. I definitely think that my goal is to do more understanding on student thinking so that I can understand how to approach their learning better. But being really comfortable with, you know, Joe Cool, Snappy, you know, you're the only you. So if you're only you, that's you're the best one. And so I think that that's what students are going to develop online is because they're not in the class with with each other. They're not competing with each other. They're just doing their own thing separately. And so trying to instill that you're doing your own thing separately, separately, you're not in competition with each other. Your A doesn't mean someone else gets a B. You can both get A's. That's fine. And so trying to decrease that one-upsmanship in the classroom, I think will be really important. And I think that that's something that people will come to expect after being in virtual learning because they haven't had to one up each other. Like I never hand anything back in class so that they can't compare with each other. And I think I'm going to take it to a next level with that. Interesting. So you got some pretty good plans. It sounds like pretty big plans for going back to face to face. Yeah. I have, I, I haven't even, after we've already gone back, I haven't even thought about it. I mean, shoot, I'm trying to make it to the end of each day. If you ask me the question now, like, you know, when we go back to face to face, I want everything to go back to exactly how it was before all of this started. I liked the way I had my classes. I feel like the way I assessed students was fair. Uh, I feel like students learned in my class. I feel like students were engaged in my class. So I don't, aside from maybe some minor organizational things behind the scenes, you know, I'm just itching to get back to that classroom setting you know that's what i that's why i wanted this job is so that i could teach in the classroom i didn't want this job to do grading i didn't want it to sit in department meetings like most of us i think we just want to engage with the students and and teach them cool stuff i agree Um, so that's where i want to be when we get back into the the classroom more organized version of myself (laughs) yeah maybe yeah that's we'll all lump that in with the behind the scenes organizational stuff (laughs) Definitely be a little more organized and, and maybe uh, just just small stuff that, that students probably won't even notice, but will help me be more organized and probably have an indirect effect on the students. But other than that, nothing, no plans. I just want to get back in there, you know? Yeah, maybe this is uh, something we can talk about when classes once again return to face-to-face instruction. And uh, maybe at the end of that first semester, we can touch base again and 
see if uh, any changes were made because of all this experience. Well, Jessica, Nolan, uh, this has been really wonderful to talk to you. Uh, thank you so much for giving up uh, almost an hour of your time on a Friday. And uh, I hope you guys stay safe. Friday, Saturday, Monday, Tuesday, whatever. It's all the same day, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Paul. Off this morning, so it's a weekday. <laughs> That's the perfect answer to end the podcast. Bye. Okay. Bye. I'd like to again thank Nolan and Jessica for spending some time with me to share their personal experiences of what it's been like to be an engineering instructor during the first semester of online instruction due to the ongoing pandemic. Hopefully this conversation gives engineering students a better idea of the technical and personal challenges faced by instructors and will give them some hope that instructors are working hard behind the scenes to adjust to this new style of teaching. So take care, everyone. Please be safe. Goodbye for now.